para la patentabilidad de una nueva ola de tecnologías. Jesper Mark Wenzel Bodesco, Dinamarca Gregory Gramenopoulos Finnegan Henderson Ferbo, Garrett and Danner, LLP, Estados Unidos Moderador, Roberto Ríos Hogland and Pamias, PSC, Puerto Rico Hi, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. And again, welcome to this uh, topic, uh, New Road Ahead for Patentability of a New Wave of Technologies. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting topic. And uh, today we have two uh, extraordinary panelists with vast experience that uh, I'm sure will enlighten us uh, in uh, answering some concerns and questions that uh, are common to new uh, emerging technologies. I'll start today's presentations or topics by, uh, by generalizing the fact that it, it's been said in the past that patent systems uh, have always been the engine of global economies. Uh, and, and at the same time, it has also been said that emerging technologies are at the heart of modern knowledge-based economies. So, you know, by association, one can argue that in a way, Patent systems are the engine that propels new emerging technologies. See, when a new technology is disclosed to the world the first time, it, you know, it's usually done uh, by means of a peer review scientific publication. Uh, at that particular time, there are few, if any, patents at all that are directed to that specific technology. So at the very beginning of that process, companies must take a decision whether to continue investing on research and development based on current patent landscape for a technological area that hopefully might encompass that emerging technology, while also considering the great deal of uncertainty as to the ultimate scope of protection that could be potentially secured for that technology. So it must be evident at this point, at least at this point, I should say, that patent laws and policies as well as the prospect of future patent protection are key aspects that in a way we could say define the future of new technologies. Now, once an emerging technology is well developed to the point where a commercial implementation is achievable, patent systems by their own nature impose the meets and bounds that are allowed to protect, uh, for us to protect that commercial implementation, I should say. So, and if we also take into consideration that the subject matter eligibility and the eventual patentability of any technology per se might be either limited or excluded by courts, then it must be clear that there are many contributing factors that affect the road for patentability and enforcement of new emerging technologies. So today in our topic, we'll discuss the contrast between the way the patent systems have managed some once emerging technologies in the past and the way those same patent systems are currently handling so emerging technologies. At the end, we believe that by doing so, we could reasonably extrapolate what are the possible constraints and or advantages those new technologies might face ahead of, our, uh, of their patentability. Uh, so in order to continue our presentation today, uh, I'm going to leave you with our first panelist, uh, Jesper Mark Wenzel, uh, who's going to be talking about the uh, some background in terms of what's been going on with patent system and emerging technology. Jesper, all yours. Thank you, Roberto. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to, to it's an honor to be able to speak for you today. Um, I I would have preferred to travel to to area and then we will have a party tonight. But uh, now I'm sitting here in Denmark and it's nine in the evening and uh, and okay that's how it is with Corona. Um, I am um, 
I, my, I, I represent a company called, uh, I would like to just introduce myself first, and I represent a company called Budesko. And that's, that's um, I'm from Denmark, it's a Danish company, and we are actually one of the oldest uh, companies in Denmark that has that have worked within this area of IP uh, advising. Um, some of the special things with, with our company is that we we have a we have very strong we have persons that's very strong in education. Uh, we have we are not, not normally it's it's my colleagues and I who are used in in the big litigation in the big Danish litigation cases and norm, mainly within the biology and so on uh, chemical and so on. Um, but another thing our company also try to to be very good at is that we are not just we're not just a company that helps clients prosecute their patents from 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 a draft to grant, but we actually try to get close to the clients much time before that, so that we can be involved in the strategies and uh, and they can we can be a partner already when they develop new inventions and so on. But, um, myself, I'm the one of the picture. You can also see him on the video. Um, I have been working with patents for more than 20 years, and my speciality te technically is uh, software electronics. Um, and the, the driver for me for working in this area is, is, is to, be, to help these poor people understand what we are doing. Uh, because IP is very, very important, but uh, it's also very complex. and. Um, I think now I have been in this business for so long that there is a tendency that that we in this business try to talk very complex and it's hard for a normal client that's a medium-sized company who doesn't have any internal specialists and so on to understand this very complex world that we represent. So somebody has to to help them to to use this very important area for for commercializing their products. And that's the that that's my my call in this world is to 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 be the one who is able to bring IP to the people. I want to be the one who who doesn't speak like the European Patent Office, but uh, the one who translates what they say to normal language that can be understood by a uh, a business developer, or a managing director, an R D manager, and so on. And that's not what not what just what I do. That's also the call. I just I just joined Budisco uh, three months ago as a co-owner, and that's the travel that I want to bring Budisco on. That we should be the one who does that uh, and be very good at doing that, because there's a need in as I see there's a need at least in our, my area. But not enough about me and enough about Budisco. Um Today. Um, the, um, the the uh, my the the whole subject was that I, I that we were were talk to talk about is that the technology spectrum keeps growing and improving as industries perfect new perfect new technologies or venture into previously unknown technologies, and then they say how will the patent system adapt to the new technologies and which of these new maverick technologies seems to be the candidates to lead the way into the future. Um, so mainly, the two questions here is which of these new maverick technologies seems to be the candidates to lead the way into the future? And another question is how will the patent system adapt to these new technologies? So let's so, so in order to do that, I've been looking a little at back in to see what do what do you think is important new technologies for the future? And I was googling a lot and really uh, searching around and I found this place where they discussed this, that the 17 most important technologies for the coming years. And 17, and a lot of these, I have a, a, some, a few citations from these 17 that's different people from the co important companies that have said something about what they think will be the future. Um, one of them is, is this where, where AI is going to be used for optimizing manufacturing, so that that AI can, so that we don't have so much loss in the in material and in the and in, and in travel and so on when things are being produced, so that it would be much much more efficiently produced, and thereby we can save a lot. 
this is also something that has been more relevant because of the COVID-19. So, so here AI is going to play a role in uh, optimized manufacturing. Another citation was from this guy, Jim Flatt from Brightseed. And um, he, he thinks that, uh, that the, the whole thing about uh, making sure that you eat the healthy food and you get the best nutrition, that's also going to be AI powered for the future. So AI is going to make sure that we adapt what we eat to what, we, what our bodies can manage. I also note, I also found this citation from a, from some, from a person called Todd Bullard, and that's uh, that the whole idea is here that that they are going to to blur the physical and virtual spaces together so that we don't really have to be present. We can actually join a concept from from somewhere else, but we we, we will get the real feeling of being actually there. And again, AI is the is the star of this show. Then we also have construction. And when it comes to constructing constructing offices, factories, and so on, also here, uh, AI will play a, a very important role against the star. And then, and in medicine, they also mention AI as, as the thing that can make sure that we perfect the medicine to be as effective as, as, effective as possible. So, so you could say by I was reading it was 17 things that was there that that was all going to be going to be very important in the future, and AI is mentioned a lot of times. So without taking too much chances, I would say that AI must be one of the things that we should expect a lot from in the future, and that we maybe already are expect getting some something from. Then the question is, how will the patent system adapt to? A new technology as AI, for example, and um, so so we have to look into the future and and, and, and philosopher and make some philosophies about that. But let's that's of course hard to, to know something about the future. So so as uh, as uh, this famous person Albert Einstein said, if you want to know the future, maybe we should look at the past. So what has happened so far with the patent system when it when it comes to new technology? And uh, I, I, as I mentioned, I have been working 20 years in the business. So what has come up? What kind of new technologies has we seen in that, in that period? And the thing that I have been very much involved in, in, uh, in, my, in my time is in this business, is, um, is, uh, is software. Software, that's a, that is something that I have seen being, being discussed a lot in patent systems. And especially because I'm, I'm a software specialist and I'm educated within software. Something else I also heard a little bit about is gene technology and plants and so on. Uh, I'm not a specialist here, but um, that's also so, uh, that's I have noticed that has also given some he headache around the, around with my colleagues and so on. The thing. What I've noted about these uh, new technologies is that, uh, and what what seems to have been the challenge here is that that the patent, at least the European patent uh, um, rules, they they mention that that there's something that should not be patentable: discoveries, scientific theories, mathematical methods, aesthetic creation, methods for performing mental acts and games, mm -hmm. programs for computers, and presentation of information. Um, and this has really that that has given me some challenge at least for for the first patents within these areas, because when you read it, software as such has been is excluded from patentability. Um, there has been a lot of um, there has been a lot of uh, case law discussions. There have been cases where the where the board of appeal of the European Patent Office has has made some decisions and remake these decisions and then the guidelines which are the rules that are being used by the patent uh, to the patent examiners to, to find out how to examine patents they have also been written and rewritten and rewritten a couple of times to to all adapt to this new technology and and at some at the end as we all know and i know it's more or less the same things as far as i know that i have that has happened in a lot of the other jurisdictions then we have it has been decided that of course software should be patented 
but it has to be a technical solution to a technical problem. So it's just how do we, how should we draft the claims? How should we focus the patents in order to get a patent? But, and the same thing, I will not go into details here, but the same thing is what has happened with gene and DNA technology, that, that they are used for some kind of process, something or there. It's, it's, it's defined how to get, get it out. Uh, the, the genes, then you can get a pattern of that part. But I mean, again, I'm not a specialist here. But the, the general thing I just noticed is that uh, we have we have these new uh, technologies, and then there are uh, then we we have the patent law, and then we, we just find a way how to navigate uh, within the patent law with these new technologies. And in the in the beginning, there is a lot of fluctuation. That's why I'm trying to illustrate that the right here, where we try to how, how do we drive uh, along this? How do we get a pattern that with these new technologies? And there is a lot of confusion in the beginning, and then at some time, we find a way uh, to to handle it. So so the, the general comment here is that we have uh, we have not really changed the, the patent law, but we have just we have just had to find a way to, to navigate within the patent law using based on these new technologies. Um, so, so, so what, what is, and some other challenges that has been there in order to be able to do that is, of course, one thing is how to navigate within these new technologies. But another thing is also, um, that now, now is suddenly a new technology. So the patent office needs some new experts who can understand this technology, and uh, that can that will there will al always be a backlog there, both because the patent office don't have all these uh, experts in the beginning, and because we as patent attorneys we we also will need to get these experts who knows about this very new technology. Uh, at the same time, often when we have a new technology, everybody wants to have a patent within that technology. So a lot of patents is being filed in the beginning, and that's uh, and so the combination of lack of uh, knowledge in the patent office at, and at, by the patent attorneys combined with the big amount of patents being filed is of course create some kind of backlog, and then that is more or less uh, visible in different jurisdictions as far as I have noticed. Another thing is also that when we drop when we make these new patent applications. When we make this patent application in these new fields, then maybe we don't make the, the claims uh, as good as they should be. Uh, the quality of the patent is not really as it should be. Um, there could be problems also when it comes to litigation later. So, but but I think the the general thing I just noticed here is that what I would conclude, and maybe I've missed something here, but what based on my experience is that. The law is not really changed. There is a lot of uh, confusion uh, for how should we manage uh, this new technology. And then we, we adapt the case law, we adapt uh, the guidelines, and then at some times we find a way to, to handle it. So then the question is, uh, when we should look into the future, what will uh, we just do the same? And now um, I, I think I will become a little more philosophic, philosophic here because, uh, as I see, the technology and the and the biology is getting more and more merged. So because the the technology is becoming more and more like humans, and the humans become more and more um, machines in the sense that we we merge all this. And and should we be able to have patents like we do today? Uh, I would think that maybe in the future, emotions, beauty, personality, should that be patentable and should be patentable for 20 years? Uh, I am actually, I think it's very interesting to see what will happen with the patent system in the future because, I, I, to be honest, I don't think we can just maintain the same laws as we have today. We have to rethink the whole system. And that's going to, uh, I hope I can experience that. But well, that's that's yeah. So let's let's discuss that. But um, that's a very philosophic discussion. And that's for me. Gregory, you're, you're welcome to jump in. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Jesper. 
Uh, remember to stop sharing your screen. Sorry. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Uh, uh, again, thank you very much for the uh, for the uh, for the presentation. I think that uh, we we do have a uh, at least a better understanding as to you know I think at least from the European Patent Office uh, perspective as to what's usually being done in terms of, of of how the patent offices and the patent systems approaches new technologies. Uh, there, there's always been uh, some tendency to uh, maintain in a way the status quo. So I think that one of your main conclusions is that patent, patent offices and patent systems historically tend to adapt uh, to new technologies and, and the intricacies of each technology. Uh, and that probably uh, we, should, we should state and see how patent offices are currently treating what should be the next technology in terms of their current policies and, uh, and examination procedures. Uh, and for that, I will leave you with our next uh, panelist, uh, Gregory Graminopoulos, uh, which will, um, as the presentation says, uh, give us a glimpse into what's going on nowadays with uh, our patent system and, and some emerging technologies in the hopes that eventually uh, we can draw some takeaways and conclusions as to the future of the patentability for new wave of technologies. Uh, Greg, the mic is all yours. Thank you, Roberto. Um, and um, I'm, I'm uh, thankful also for the invitation to uh, participate in this uh, webinar. It's, it's a quite interesting topic, as was mentioned. Uh, again, my name is Greg Graminopoulos. I'm with the law firm Finnegan Henderson. We are one of the largest IP firms in the United States and also one of the largest IP firms globally. Uh, I'm a partner with the firm in, in their uh, Washington, D.C. office. Um, I have uh, over 20 years experience. I work primarily in, in the computer and software fields like Jesper. Um, and uh, we work with clients obviously to help procure and protect their inventions and also enforce and license, uh, license their IP. Um, I'd like to start off with a um, little discussion around the scope of technologies that are driving change. Uh, and what does that mean for our practices and and for the patent offices around the world in terms of addressing what should be protected and what exactly do you need to do to get protection. Um, I, I think it's quite clear that there are many new technologies today driving change across many industries. Uh, Jesper mentioned AI as one example, and I'll get into that a little bit more. But of course, we're seeing a lot of other technologies, autonomous vehicles, uh, AR, VR, um, um, gene technology is also mentioned by Jesper, space exploration, new fuel systems. Uh, also in agriculture, we're seeing quite a bit of change with vertical farming and, and other sorts of mechanicized uh, solutions. And the way I view it is technology builds on itself. So if you think about the evolution of time and how technologies have gradually built upon one another, we are now sort of at an inflection point with having all of our, let's just say, our knowledge uh, from computers to software, to gene technology and things like that. We're now, we're really on an exponential uh, increase in terms of new technologies coming out and just changing the whole landscape. I mean, I, I could go on with a list of technologies that we're all seeing more and more today. Uh, another good example is blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies, which, which are impacting the investing and, and fintech space. And so these, these new technologies raise many issues for us in the legal space. Uh, what are the legal issues and challenges that come to mind? Uh, well, first and foremost, we, you know, this is sort of the title of, of uh, our presentation here, is what's patentable, what should be patentable. Um, when you go down below that, you look at other issues like what and who, are, who would be the inventor for this technology. 
uh, who are the owners of the technology. Um, inventorship is actually a pretty interesting question when you look at AI, because with AI, you have sort of the merging of technology and human thought, as I think Jesper was alluding to in his presentation. So what if an AI machine invents something? Should, should the AI uh, be an inventor? Is that possible under our laws? And who would be the owner of that invention if an AI system invented something? And what if you had multiple um, companies involved with that effort uh, in terms of the data, someone supplying the data, someone supplying the computer technology, and then someone orchestrating the um, AI system, working through all of that and coming up with uh, new solutions. Uh, you then also have to think about what, what has to be disclosed. Uh, what, what is the general knowledge of the skilled artisan in the space and what must you disclose? What can you keep as a trade secret? How do you strike that balance? Um, how would you claim this invention? And, um, you know, what that normally hits on several issues and requirements uh, under our national patent laws in terms of the form of claims and how you identify, describe the invention and and so forth. Um, how do you enforce the patents? Uh, we're talking about virtual worlds and <laughs> AI systems and, and things that are crossing boundaries and geographic borders. So that raises a lot of questions. Uh, and then as we get down into enforcement issues, what would be a reasonable royalty or damages uh, if there was infringement? Should you be entitled to an injunction? Uh, for this te particular technology. And we've seen some of this play out um, more recently with, uh, if you think about uh, the mobile space with the 4G and now we're coming out with the 5G technologies, there's lots of disputes around uh, what would be the acceptable royalty rate, what would be a FRAN rate as they say in that industry, and who decides that? Should you be entitled to an injunction if you can't come to an agreement on the royalty? Um, and then we've also seen with the pandemic and the development of the vaccines, countries thinking about uh, waiving IP rights on those vaccines to allow the technology to go out further to more people. And there's also a good amount of discussion around whether that's a good idea or a bad idea in terms of uh, waiving uh, patent rights on, on new developed drugs. I don't think we're gonna address all of these topics today. Uh, we could probably spend the whole week discussing these, but let's, let's, let's go a little bit further and talk about some of the more uh, practical things as practitioners that we have to deal with and also interacting with clients and key stakeholders. Um, so obviously, and, and I think Roberto referred to this at the beginning of the presentation, knowledge is really important here. So as practitioners, we, you know, we formerly were trained in, certain areas of technology when we were going through college and things changed a lot since then. So, you know, as, as a practitioner in the space, as, as an advice, as a legal advisor, yes, you need to keep up with the law, but you also need to keep up with the technology. And that's really important because when you talk to your clients and you try to identify what will be protected, you need to speak their language and you need to have a good understanding about what exactly is new and what is old and what's valuable and so forth. Uh, this is also very important for examiners at patent offices around the world that they keep uh, their uh, 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 examiners up to date with the technology because they also have to be apprised of developments on uh, what's new and what's old. I mean, to a certain extent, they will get that uh, working at the patent office because they see so much technology coming in. But um, just from personal experience, I know many national patent offices, the USPTO and others, uh, tend to organize uh, specific training for examiners to keep up on technology. And then once you have the understanding, the knowledge, and so forth, then you need to also think about how these cases are going to be prosecuted uh, under current patent laws, because we can't just keep changing things every time. A new law, a new technology comes in. We try to fit it within our existing laws. And there's probably a good reason to do that because a lot of the existing technology provides a foundation for the new technology. A lot of new technologies don't just come in from outer space. 
Uh, these are these are solutions and things that have built upon earlier um, earlier inventions and innovations by other inventors, and and some of them are based on uh, scientific truths and, and things that have been known for for many years. Um, so, anyways, you need you need to you need to get the knowledge and training. That's a challenge. You need to get the guidelines. You need to understand how this will work uh, within. Uh, legal framework that we have, the patent laws that we have, uh, and then and then working and going forward, you need to, uh, as, as I put it here, partner with industry and uh, key stakeholders and have discussions when things can't be solved by existing laws. Do we need to think about uh, new laws or amendments to our laws, uh, our laws, or find solutions uh, for protecting? Um, key innovations. I, I think AI is one area where we're going to see more of this, more discussions uh, and sharing of information. Um, the USPTO has done studies on AI. I know um, other national patent offices have done it as well uh, to get the discussion going around whether there's enough protection available or whether things need to change uh, so that there's good IP protection for, for this technology going forward. Okay, let's let's uh, let's talk about AI a little bit. I I appreciate that some of you may already have a good understanding of the technology, while some of you may not. Um, perhaps some of you don't come from the computer software space. So I'll try to try to give an overview um, and then get into more um, practical discussion about what AI um, is and how people are protecting it. Um, so there, there have been many uh, attempts to define AI, and um, this is just one of several definitions. Um, and 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 this one actually touches on uh, common truth, which is that AI is fundamentally uh, comprised of software and hardware. It, the things that run AI are software and hardware. And when we think about AI further, we we know that. It's designed to solve complex problems, make predictions, understand and undertake tasks, and, and do many things that are human-like uh, in terms of sensing, perception, planning, learning, communication, physical action, and so forth. So uh, that's a pretty good definition. There, there are more targeted definitions that try to characterize the level of AI in terms of its capabilities, uh, whether it's more or less human-like or more complex in terms of its abilities. I think we're still on uh, very much a learning curve in terms of AI and, you know, as, as many have said, just at the beginning of this uh, journey of uh, implementing things with AI-based technologies. Um, now, we didn't just get here in the last five, 10 years. This has been something that has been worked on for many decades, actually. So the original thought about computers and how they could be used to develop intelligent machines actually goes back to the 50s, okay? And through time, and as we've advanced our computing capacities, memory capacities, ability process things, more and more techniques have evolved over time. Uh, and this has become a science, you know, machine learning techniques, just the way that the, the computerized system can do something and then learn from it and actually become more intelligent over time. That's one of the key aspects of AI is the learning aspect of it. Uh, and then deep learning is this notion of higher level of, let's just say, analytical type abilities and um, the ability to go through large volumes of data, let's say, and make sense of it, okay? So the perfect, the perfect uh, problem for AI is when there's a large volume of data and there's a very specific problem or analyses that you need to do um, and there's an ability to learn as you process that data and, and so forth. So it's a very defined space like that. Uh, AI can do quite wonderful things. Um, as, as we see, uh, as, you know, AI is behind autonomous vehicles. There's still more work to be done there, but that's a very good problem set for AI. Um, there's been uh, also work uh, 
Um, some of this is kind of fun, but actually just shows the, the ability of the system. So uh, in the areas of chess and go, um, which have complex number of possible moves, uh, building systems that can beat world champions uh, at, at Chinese Go and, and chess. That's, um, is it gonna save humanity? No, but in building those systems, they've actually learned quite a bit in terms of how to develop an AI system and how to structure its components and so on. So um, if, we, if we break it down, AI has actually many different components, and this is how the patent office looks at it generally. Uh, they don't just put a label on it and say it's AI, because okay? that's too broad of a label. What you need to look at is what particular area of technology or innovation are you working on? Is it knowledge processing? Is it speech? Is it the hardware system underneath the AI system? Is it uh, natural language processing? Is it machine learning? Is it a vision system? Is it planning, controlling, and so forth? So they've, they've actually done a very good job of organizing these component technologies so that the examination can be much done much uh, more efficiently and better at the patent office. Uh, if you ask me, a lot of these component technologies have just sort of naturally developed over time. Uh, because we've had computers and software uh, for decades now, and you will find, um, let's just say, traditional AI solutions in some of these areas, but you'll also find things that are just purely algorithmic. Uh, when I mean algorithmic is that they're not really uh, an AI type system where you're learning and advancing. It's uh, just a routine sort of coded way of doing things. Sometimes people will still call that AI because it's a machine acting and thinking like, like a human, or at least at some level. Okay, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's widely known now that we are anticipating AI to influence, influence a wide range of, of, uh, a wide range of industries as well as applications, um, Internet of Things, finance, health, manufacturing, transportation, robotics, uh, people are also trying to um, create AI systems for um, our area, practice of law, um, accounting, um, the internet, and so forth. Uh, there's been lots of studies looking at trends with respect to AI, and, and, and manufacturing is one of those where they're, they're expecting big changes. Another area is in healthcare and in pharmaceuticals. Um, PwC issued a report in 2017 where they had estimated that would be one, one field where the highest impact would be realized. And we can already see solutions, rapid drug discovery. Uh, some of the vaccines were developed through the benefit of AI systems, being able to parse through uh, lots of clinical data uh, and identify targets or potential vaccines uh, for COVID. Um, you're also going to see robotic surgery. There are a lot of systems now actually on the market. Uh, these, these robotic surgery, you know, these systems can, can actually operate more efficiently, um, more precisely than some of the best doctors out there. We're going to see telehealth systems come on board, as well as smart medical devices and diagnostics. So um, the list goes on and on in terms of the influence in AI in uh, many different industries. Globally, if you look at uh, patent grants for AI, it's, it's just a general uh, exponential increase as we've been seeing through the years. Um, this is showing the breakdown of patents uh, between, as between the USPTO, that's in blue, the uh, EPO, that's in brown, uh, and other large uh, patent offices uh, such as in China and Japan. In South Korea. So uh, the trend is there. It's going to continue, and we're going to continue to see more and more uh, filings as we go into the future. Again, things are building on each other, and um, <clears throat> one thing begets three things, and you just it's sort of an exponential um, evolution in the technology. This was an interesting report um, that was issued by the USPTO on exactly what are we seeing in terms of the component technologies and, and 
filing. So you can also see a, a very steady increase across the different AI component technologies, planning, knowledge systems, AI hardware, vision, machine learning, and so on and so forth. And then there's also studies out there which actually break it down by company, follow who, you know, who are the key uh, innovators and uh, patent filers in terms of AI systems. Okay, let's, let's go on to the uh, next section here, which is looking at uh, legal issues. And so I mentioned at the top of my presentation that inventorship is one of those issues that uh, people are looking at. Um, and there, there's actually been some, I'll call them test cases under the, I'll call it the Davis, um, Davis applications. Uh, we'll look at those and, and the rulings by the US PTO and EPA, European Patent Office. Uh, patentability obviously is another one which um, was, was referenced to. We'll talk about that. And then we'll look at disclosure requirements for the specification and claim drafting strategies, okay? Um, a lot of this, you'll see um, that the outcomes that we've seen so far uh, are, be, are working from the existing laws that we have. And it's quite natural that you fit, you fit the new technology under your existing body of, uh, of uh, statutes and requirements and interpretations of those. And as I said earlier, the new technology is based on the old technologies. So typically there's a lot of overlap in terms of things and in prior rulings. And if it's AI, you're typically looking at rulings in the computer software space. Um, but there, there could be new issues that come up that haven't really been addressed before. And then you get a lot of questions and uncertainty. So in terms of patentability, we, in the US, we have the, this Alice decision, which I think has been uh, discussed quite a bit in um, presentations like this and international conferences. So in the US, we have um, exceptions to patentability. Uh, you can't patent natural phenomena, laws of nature, or abstract ideas. Um, and if you, direct, if you have a very broad abstract claim directed to any of these sort of principles or excluded subject matter, you won't be able to get a patent. Now, uh, over time, um, there's been questions about where the line is in terms of something excluded versus something permissible for patentability. And that's when you get into a discussion or analysis around, are you claiming something more than the abstract idea or law of nature, natural phenomena? Usually if you're talking about computers and software, you're talking about abstract ideas. Uh, and it's also true with the AI type invention. It's going to be a question whether this is something abstract or you've actually, um, you've actually identified and claimed something not conventional, well understood, and, and you have a specific solution. Uh, it's an advance over the prior art. And we've started to see some guidelines come from the USPTO um, related to AI uh, systems or, or inventions. This was one example. Uh, it's a computer implemented method for training a neural network for facial detection. Um, and actually, it's, it's how, do you, how do you train the system to have that capability? So this claim was directed to, as you can see, collecting a set of digital facial images from a database, applying transformations to the data, creating a first training set. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. Training the neural network, which is a, which is a well-known, neural network is well-known computer configuration for AI, training that neural network with the first stage data, uh, creating a second training set, uh, and then uh, training, further training the neural network with a second training set. So there's a, there's, there's a good number of uh, specifics in here, and this is a particular way of training the AI system to be smart enough to recognize faces. And the patent office said that this claim would be a good example of one that would be um, patentable uh, or directed to patentable subject matter uh, because it did not merely claim mathematical you know, formula or mental process or uh, any of the other type of recognized abstract ideas like the method of organizing 
connectivity. So there's enough specifics in this, technical specifics in it, to convert it into something that is um, patentable or el patent eligible, as we say in the US. Um, you could think about this claim if you drafted it in a very broad fashion and you just said, I have a system for facial recognition. The person stands in front of the camera and then the system identifies who it is. That, that would be too abstract. Uh, and frankly, it'd also be invalid because there's already prior art um, for facial recognition technology, right? So you got to be very specific uh, in terms of what the invention is. Here, they're focusing on the training aspect of the AI system, and that would be accepted under our patent laws. Uh, in Europe, there's, there's also exclusions. Uh, I think Jesper can comment on this further if, if we get into Q&A on this. But, you know, generally, there's excluded subject matter areas, computer programs, uh, mathematical methods, and so forth. It's somewhat, somewhat similar um, uh, to, to, um, to the U.S. exclusions. And in, in Europe, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more, um, I would say, difficult under existing law um, to, to recite a patentable invention. But there is a common, let's say, common uh, area of the claim types that would work in the U.S. and Europe. And again, you're normally uh, trying to deduce down what is the invention and making sure you have enough technical, as I say, technical character, uh, technical problems or technical solution, and having that recited specifically in the claim uh, so that it, it's, it's uh, viewed uh, as patentable subject matter under Article 52. Okay, so you're gonna wanna put in those details. Uh, now, what are people protecting? Um, well, um, we've seen we've seen already a good number of issued patents uh, in the AI field, and um, as you can imagine, they're they're not abstract or concept oriented. They they should be directed to uh, particular uh, systems, methods, ways of doing things, and a lot of this flows somewhat naturally from what we were doing let's just say 10 years ago, for computer implemented systems. They were normally focusing on these types of things. So you can patent, for example, the system architecture. How is the AI system organized? And what are the main components of the AI system in terms of neural networks, convolution layers, uh, expert knowledge components, and so forth. And you can claim those as a, as a combination and claim them functionally, how they interact with each other. Uh, you can also do it from the data processing side, so a method of processing data for a particular result. Uh, so it could be for diagnosis, analysis of health side effects of a particular drug compound, uh, drug discovery, uh, a list manufacturing method or process, and so on and so forth. What's going to be very important here is that you get very specific about the data inputs, how the data is processed and data outputs. And you have to do that in a, in a way that is focusing on the technical aspects of that, that data processing. Um, perhaps not a surprise, but you can also claim the method of learning or training the AI system. Uh, this is actually quite important because there's a reason why some AI systems are better than others. And Usually, it comes down to the way that they were trained. Uh, you used to normally start, it's well known that you normally start with a training set of data, and then from there, you have lots of different options in terms of the way that you can train a system. It can be um, fully automated, so one computer training another computer, or it can be human assisted. They call that supervised versus unsupervised. So, you actually have a, a human, or someone skilled in that industry sort of reinforcing uh, and providing inputs and training the system. Uh, and then you have concepts like back propagation, kind of feedback, things like that. So you can, you can claim learning and training. Uh, you may have a new way of learning or training a system with a very small set of data. Uh, someone may need 2 million, 5 million pieces of uh, training set data. Maybe you've come up with a way 
where the system can learn a very small subset of data, maybe a few thousand, and it's just the smartest system. Uh, and, that, and actually the goal going forward is to, in AI is to train with smaller sets of data and make the system smart enough, just like young kids and babies are able to learn to do things without much, without much data to start with. Okay. Uh, then you can think about the commercial product, the end product. So um, you could claim the AI enabled apparatus or method as it's finally assembled or used. Um, so, you know, and here you probably get more particular about the industry in which it's going to be used in. Is it a smart health monitor? Is it a robotic surgery equipment? Is it a virtual uh, treatment or health, health, telehealth product? And you're going to have in that claim, um, you will probably have a little bit of the system architecture, probably have a little bit of the data processing and steps in there. But you're going to try to capture the final apparatus or method as it's used. Uh, commercially. Uh, and then you can start thinking about other types of claims, um, a product by A process, uh, things like that, which get, uh, which will depend on national laws, whether you can do product by process, and things like that. So the, the list kind of goes on from there with creativity. And we, we've worked with clients typically when we, when we, we have lots of clients in the AI field, when we work with them, we sort of go through the different claim types. We try to identify which ones are most valuable um, and, and interesting for, for their you know, for the file. Okay, let's talk about AI inventorship. So, um, you know, what do you, uh, this was the problem I sort of put out there at the beginning. What do you do when, when you have, um, when you have something invented or created by, uh, an AI system, and it, it just so happens there's already been a test case uh, put through the major patent offices. Uh, this system was uh, filed with uh, Dabas, it's an AI system, as, as the inventor. Uh, there were actually two applications. Uh, one was uh, for an invention related to an interlocking container system, and another one was uh, controllable. Um, uh, system and and what they did is they had filed it with with the intent of sort of of um, pushing the envelope or <laughs> having having the the patent office address this front on and um, what what happened was um, in in all cases in the U.S. and U.K. EPO. Uh, the applications were rejected because they did not claim a natural human as, a, as an inventor. And quite consistently through each of the, um, each of the uh, offices, they pointed to the fact that the existing laws were designed or limited to inventors being a natural person because of all the not only the way that the laws were worded, but also be, think about all the requirements. Uh, the U.S., you, um, well, the law specifically refers to a natural person as the inventor. And then, you know, when you try to identify inventorship, uh, it is the person who conceived of the invention. Um, and then when you talk about joint inventorship, there has to be awareness of other co-inventors. And then you also have things like assignment and so forth. So there's a lot of concepts in there which naturally uh, lead to the conclusion that a system or machine could not be an inventor. And you would need a change in law um, to change this. Um, and it's true in the US, it's true in Europe, and so forth. Um, and it, it promulgates through decisions and issues that we look at for inventorship and uh, standards are related around it. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, one or more of these cases are going on appeal. Uh, it may be eventually that more and more, you know, AI invented uh, things get out there and then there's just a need to have uh, an exception, if you will, where you could list an AI system as a better or co-inventor 
Um, maybe it doesn't really matter because ultimately um, the ownership is is what uh, is at issue. And so if you can, you know, the applicant, um, and if you if it's quite clear who the applicant is, the, the application can go forward. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see how this this plays out. Uh, I, I I think just to touch on Jesper's comment about you know machines becoming more human. Well, as that happens, I think people will have less of an issue with claiming a listing a machine as a co-inventor or inventor if, if you can identify and see um, you know sort of points of conception, novelty, and things like that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But right now. As, um, as an inventor, you must have a natural person. Um, and that's true in Europe and, and in the patent office. Okay. Uh, what, one thing to keep in mind as a practitioner is when you have collaborations in the AI space, you need to think about IP assignment and ownership, uh, particularly if, if systems, or particularly if uh, companies are uh, contributing different things to the research. I, I gave the example of someone contributing the data set versus someone contributing the AI system or platform. When you bring those two together uh, and you have a team working on it, who's gonna own, who's gonna own the invention? Uh, the system contributing, uh, sorry, the company contributing the AI system may just be contributing the AI system and no people may be involved. Whereas the, you know, the company contributed the data, uh, may have data scientists. And who would be the inventor if drugs are identified? Is it the data scientist or should you give ownership uh, to the inventions uh, to the AI system platform owner because, you know, they, they really have the system that went through and worked through all this data to identify. So it brings up a lot of issues. Uh, and the other thing you're gonna have to do just because of the rule I mentioned under DOM is that you'll need to look for human inventors to identify a name of the patent application, and you'll need to look for things to claim that were human invented. But it, you know, a lot of the cases that come across our desk at, at uh, Finnegan, this has not been really that much of an issue um, in terms of identifying human inventors. Maybe that will change more and more in the future. But the issue about who owns is one that uh, comes up and the assignment licensing are, are key issues now. Um, and then as we go into the future for litigation on these patents, you'll be looking at all of these, all of these points. Okay, let's go to disclosure requirements. I think, I think most of, most of that is we feel familiar with the rules under European laws as, as, as well as the U S and generally, um, you can't, you can't label things in black boxes and not provide much uh, detail. So we want detail, we want good disclosures. Uh, it needs to be enough so it would be understood by a person skilled in the art. And if you try to apply all those existing laws to AI, I think you come to a pretty natural conclusion that you need to think about uh, who's the team, who are the individuals or skilled person, how much do they know versus how much needs to be disclosed in terms of level of detail. And if I have particulars uh, of the AI system, how much detail on, on those components that are needed? And we're starting to see some decisions. Um, this was one actually, it's a board decision out of the EPO. This would probably be the same outcome in the US, which is they had a particular AI system, which was claimed to do particular things, but they really didn't give much disclosure about how you would train that system. There was just some general notion about having uh, a patient data from a wide spectrum of patients with different groups and so forth, um, characteristics, but they didn't really say how you would train the system. So the, the outcome here was that uh, it was found that there was an inadequate disclosure to support the invention because they, didn't, they did not provide a detail on how actually trained the system and got it up and going, okay? Um, so that's an important lesson. Um, and, and as I said, it'd be the same under the US. Uh, 
Keep in mind for the US, we have the additional requirements in terms of uh, best mode. Uh, and that's based on contemplation of preferred environments and so forth by the inventors. And you can't, if you're claiming something, the invention, and you've got um, particular ways of doing it or best mode of vision by the inventor at the time of filing, you'll need to include the details. So it could be the exact way that you're training or training set data, or it could be the arrangement of the AI components and so forth. That will need to be included in the application. Okay. Um, there are, um, this is from the USPTO side, and it can be seen with other national patent offices. There are training materials and guidance issued by the office so that you can, I gave you one example from before on an AI system and the, the uh, patent office's view with respect to patentability. There's lots of other uh, training uh, materials that are available and if it's not directly on point, it'll be um, related enough that you can apply it because you know, this is you know, computer and software technology. And uh, you can, you can in most cases, figure out what the outcome is by applying those existing laws. Okay, let's talk about claim, some claim drafting considerations before um, showing you some actual patents. Um, Issue claims. Um, these are these are things that you should consider above and beyond your your um, you know basic requirements to make sure you get the invention right in terms of what you're claiming. So you got to understand the technology, hundred percent. You got to do that right. Uh, you got to make sure the claims are directed um, to the aspect of the invention that is of interest to the client. But these are some additional questions you need to ask to make sure you're pursuing the most valuable claims. Uh, so you need to look at who infringes, uh, what infringes, when does the infringement occur, where does the infringement occur, because ultimately that's how you're gonna enforce the patent, right? So you, a lot of these uh, questions are dependent on you uh, having a good understanding of the industry, how the invention will be deployed, and probably also having a good number of uh, conversations with the inventors and perhaps the business people at the client um, about how, how, how and where this will be deployed, where are the revenue streams, um, who are their commercial partners, uh, how will this be sold, where, and so forth. Okay, so very important things. These are questions that we normally have with clients on the front end of um, the drafting process. Um, and frankly, we may also have just sort of periodic visits with clients to get a better understanding of their business and kind of develop a portfolio strategy um, for, their, for their inventions. So there's a lot of ways to get access to this information. Okay, and then on top of that, you need to think about um, some forward-looking questions like, you know, are there alternatives? Are there easy design around solutions? Do I, could this invention be equally implemented with an algorithmic solution as well as a, you know, AI network solution? Is there a way I can claim the invention without making it depend on AI or not? Uh, is there a way I can claim it where it's not dependent on my particular industry? Uh, what is the most valuable inventive aspect? What is likely to be copied by competitors? Um, are there things that you may want to protect as a trade secret? Can you make that balance and so on? And then also, um, how can I detect or prove an infringement? So monitoring infringement is quite important, and you may have done a lot of a lot of good work getting the patents granted, but if you're put in a position where the underlying technology is hard to detect or prove, you may never get to a place where you can license or enforce your patent. So you want to think about things that can be detected or easily monitored um, for infringement so that you can you know, bring your patent forward for a license or enforcement. Okay, let's just quickly um, go through a few examples here. Um, this is, and this is going to exemplify everything I showed earlier in terms of 
claim types and focus. So this is a system architecture type claim, patent to Google. Um, it's, it's to their particular architecture of parallel convolutional neural network using a uh, number of nodes and layers. Um, AI is obviously important to Google and they use it for search. And this particular type of uh, AI system is good for searching images. Okay. And so you can see the claim here, it, it gets into the very specifics of the AI system. Neural network layers, convolutional layers, pack max pooling layer, uh, fully connected layers, and a lot of other details. In there. But you can see it's not an abstract claim. And you can see it's a particular type of claim. It's a, it's a system architecture. So it's just one example. Um, here's a sort of data processing claim. Uh, this is a pack to IBM. And this is using you know, their AI systems to predict or analyze the potential side effects of a pharmaceutical. So if someone developed a particular drug or pharmaceutical, you can put it into the system. It'll analyze a bunch of data, chemical data underlying the drug, and then be able to predict the type of side effects that may occur on the drug. And that would be a very useful tool, obviously, in research if you're trying to uh, select between different solutions. Um, and so this is, again, a very specific claim with the components, the classifiers, the predictive module, side effect predictive module, correlation engine, visualization tool. And it's, and it's actually talking about the data inputs, how the data is processed, and the data outputs. Okay? Not abstract and very specific in terms of the approach. Um, here's a way of uh, learning, training. Uh, this is a quantum deep learning solution, a patent to Microsoft. Microsoft, as with Google and IBM, are big holders of AI patents. Uh, it's using a Boltzmann machine, uh, using quantum computers. So very specific on the hardware, the methodology, and then, yeah, the, you can see the learning training type method here with all those components put together. Um, here's a sort of... Uh, you know, commercial aspect, I claim the AI system or method. This is a neural network for creating synthetic images. So you're generating synthetic medical images. And what this, this is a patent to, uh, uh, to Electa. What this does is, is sort of pieces together um, uh, imagery that you're, or data that you're obtaining from a patient and being able to produce, produce a more full, it's like taking 2D images and making 3D images from them. Uh, this is very specific in terms of how the data is collected, the AI system components, the processor, and then generating the um, synthetic images. And uh, I, I think that's also a good, uh, good example. Not only, it's kind of like a two-in-one type claim because not only does it have the commercial end product in mind, it's also looking at the data processing aspects. Um, underlying the system and what probably is the most you know valuable parts of the invention okay um just to wrap up with some key takeaways now uh key point one uh i think we've all said this now as part of the webinar you know new technologies are driving innovation uh it's not occurring just in one industry but across many industries we're seeing patent filings for new technologies like ai they're increasing uh, significantly uh, in recent years, and the trend is continued to is expected to continue to the future. Uh, for us as patent practitioners and, and other key uh, stakeholders like patent offices, keeping pace with the technology is very important. So educating um, your people, educating your attorneys, educating your examiners, and understanding what those technologies are, what the innovations are about. And uh, you need to do that both at the technology level and industry level to understand how these inventions are implemented and uh, commercialized. Um, and then I think the other key takeaway for the webinar in general is that these technologies raise new questions under our patent laws, particularly as to patentability, but we're also seeing issues like inventorship for AI and then other issues like disclosure requirements. How much do you need to disclose? Uh, what's necessary and uh, 
how, how, how much do you need to put into your patent application? Uh, our existing laws and rulings provide a lot of guidance. Um, uh, and you should look at past decisions to understand how the office will likely treat your new applications. Um, of course, there could be new issues that just have not been addressed before and then you try to work, work through those. And then lastly, on the claims, um, understanding the technology of business, you need to look at not just the invention itself, but who infringes, what infringes where. And yeah, I mean, that, the, the one recommendation that we give to clients is pursue as many claim types as possible. Your invention may not be limited to specific components or combinations in your preferred embodiment and may not be listed, uh, necessarily limited to one industry. So I mean, look outside the industry for potential other uses and don't limit your claims to this direction. Okay, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Roberta. Thank you very much, Gregory. Uh, and again, thank you both of you, Jesper and, and yourself for uh, sharing with us uh, your your insights, you know, and your opinions as to what's been going on, what happened in the past, what's going on in order for us to draw at least a reasonable conclusion, right? As to what what uh, what what's the next step in terms of new emerging technologies based on what's what's happened in the past. Now, Greg, I have one follow up question in your presentation, uh, which I think it'll be uh, in a way interesting. Uh, uh, taking into consideration what Jesper explained to us in terms of how, you know, uh, patent systems in the past have, um, or the challenges that patent systems in the past have faced and, and the approaches they have taken for these new emerging technologies. Now, taking that into consideration, uh, what would you say in the specific case of artificial intelligence, which is was the case scenario that uh, we focused to try to establish what's going on nowadays with patent office, how would you say, at least in the case of the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, uh, what would you say, how would you say they have handled this technology, specifically artificial intelligence, as, as a whole and as several aspects that can be protectable independently one from another? Would you say that uh, they have adapted to those technologies or have they tried to force the protection afforded to those technologies what to what they do nowadays in terms of policies? Um, I, well, I think the patent office has been very mindful about um, new technologies and not, uh, not uh, what would you say, uh, hindering them. Um, as I think you mentioned at the top of the webinar, it's very important that patent protection is available at least at some level, so that you can foster and enable the technologies to go forward and help help companies put money into R and D and commercialize their technology. So strong patent protection, I think, is universally viewed as valuable. Um, as as we've seen with AI, um, they have done, I think, a very good job understanding the needs of the community, uh, stakeholders in the AI space. They've held lots of uh, open forums, if you will, and uh, conferences so that there can be discussions by everyone involved in terms of the pros and cons of um, protection and what's available. Uh, the patent office, I think, has done things in a, I would say, somewhat predictable way in terms of applying what we knew already from the computer and software fields in terms of the boundaries of what you can claim, what you can't claim, uh, particularly with patentability, although that's not a that's not a very easy area to define in terms of what's okay and what's not okay. But at least they've been been consistent with how they treated computer and software implemented inventions with AI inventions. Okay, so uh, things I mentioned during my presentation, uh, most of that is an outflow from what we saw already in the computer implemented space. Uh, I think the inventorship. Um, question is is really one that we can't you know solve from prior experience because we really haven't seen in the computer software fields this issue about where you can actually have a machine inventing things that's not typical um, and as we get into more advanced AI uh, evolutions and 
technology, is, I think it's going to become a, perhaps a bigger issue because if you can't list an AI system as an inventor, you may not be able to file a patent application. And that's a problem, right? So, you know, the Davis case was sort of the early test case. And, you know, as, as I understand it from um, the facts, the, those inventions were not, well, let's just say they were kind of set up for the problem. So, <laughs> Okay. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't a big company who had stumbled across the problem. It was someone who had sort of created an AI system to invent, okay, and then filed the applications to push sort of the question on AI inventorship. Uh, but but I but I think I think again as we go forward with uh, smarter AI systems and systems that can invent, there's going to be questions about hey, should we create an exception under our law? To allow an AI system to be listed as an inventor, and that'll probably work its way through uh, not just you know maybe ultimately support from the patent office, but then you'll have to go through legislative efforts to get laws changed because the patent office alone could not could not implement you know new rule new rule um, new rule allowing uh, AI um, to be an inventor. It'd have to come from Congress, at least for the U.S. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I think that's very important, which probably in a way takes me to the next point that I would like to discuss. By the way, I wanna remind the participants that you have, if they have four questions, we have a couple of them, which I'm gonna discuss briefly with you, but if they have additional questions, they could continue uh, asking their questions through the chat and, and they'll make sure uh, that I'll get them and we'll try to discuss them within the allotted time. Uh, having said that, uh, this is something that you discuss and that we've been discussing in the past, and it's that as more patent applications are filed for emerging complex technologies, uh, in a way, patent offices are forced eventually to hire and retain well-paid examiners, uh, you know, because they need to have the necessary technical background to examine these applications. Now, from an examination perspective, we, one can argue that examiners without the necessary background tend to either reject patentable inventions for lack of understanding of that technology. And of course, eventually that have an impact uh, on, on, on the desirability to patent some technologies. Uh, but even if they end up allowing the applications you might end up having uh, weak or bogus patents that shouldn't have been issued the first time. And then there's a, a great uh, possibility that end up being invalidated in courts. Now, this is a question for both of you. Uh, having stated that, which I think we can agree, it's, it's a general scenario nowadays, and in the past too, what are your thoughts of implementing a system of, of specialized patent courts for, for highly trained and educated judges and assistants uh, to complement our patenting system? That's a tough question, huh? It's a wishful thinking scenario at the end of the day. Uh, but because here's the thing, and, and I think you can agree with that. Uh, commercialization is also an important aspect of, uh, it sort of complements, you know, the patenting process. You know, you want to get a patent for something that you're actually going to, uh, your actual uh, commercialization of, of your technology. So it's sort of like a catch-21, if you want to say relationship. Uh, so with that said, you know, do you think it will help and to what extent will help to have a special line patent court? And from the local geographical perspective, meaning on a country by country basis, or perhaps on a more generalized uh, international uh, uh, context? Um, I mean, if I could say so something. Just, you, okay, Gregory. Yes, but please. Sure. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I, I I agree with you, Roberto, that it's very important that uh, that that that, only, that, it, that we get the right patents granted and and that they they are enforced right. So this this whole patent system, of course, has to be treated in a fair way. And it's not fair if uh, if if just because uh, somebody doesn't understand the patents or does not know how to handle them, then then clients don't get a fair treatment of the system. 
So if if one if a way to sort that would be to have another a specialized court to help on that part, then of course that could be good. But my concern, of course, is that right now the patent system is at least is very slow. It takes too much time to get a patent. A litigation takes a lot of time, and then if we also have to have another instance to look at it, then it, it I, I have a lot of clients who already complain a lot about how how slow everything is and. and and, and this long period of uncertainty where you don't really know if you have a valid patent or not is, uh, is very challenging for them uh, when in, in, a, in a business situation. So, of course, the, 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 the better thing would be that they, they would just be able to get, of course, that's logical, to get the, the best people that, that could get the right patents there. And so far, it has been possible, as I see it. They have been able to... To make some case law decision and, and and adapt it slowly. So, but of course, in the future, it could be a problem in the sense that we uh, there's not so many uh, at least from we have we, we like people who who are young people who like to work in this area and there's there, there's a big we are all hunting to get some patent attorneys to our company. That's a big issue here in Denmark and in Europe. And uh, the same with examiners. So there's a lack of, of the resources in our field. So um, so can we keep just getting new people who knows it? That's but, but maybe we can use artificial intelligence to grant the patent. Yeah, I was uh, I was just going to add that I think um, in terms of the technical training, I would I would put the focus first at the patent office and not the courts in terms of the specialized technical training. Um, and for the examiners already hired uh, with, with the right uh, scientific backgrounds, whether it be in you know, computer software, pharmaceuticals, um, biology, uh, that, that the PAT off, the National Patents Office get training to those people so that they understand the technology fully. I think that, that's what happens uh, now. And I know the USPTO, they, they make efforts to do that. And as you hire more and more people, um, which takes time. Uh, those people will be coming through university and college and get normally trained on these new technologies, but it takes time. For the courts, um, I, I, I think specialized IP courts are uh, special, specialized IP courts are important from the, the, the legal standpoint in terms of understanding patent laws and so forth. But when, when a judge or court needs assistance with technology that, that can be done a number of ways um, and and you know the, the attorneys can present the technology through a technology tour, tutorial uh, separate from the legal issues and disputes or you can uh, appoint a, a technical advisor to the court uh, who will answer questions and, and help the judges guide guide them through the technology and understand the basics before they get into to the dispute. Um, I, I think I agree with Jesper that it, it would be quite difficult to find um, highly specialized technical people who are also judges, because it's just, it's, it's a very long path to become a judge. Um, and if you're, if, you're, if you're that highly specialized uh, technically, you're, you're probably gonna just go into industry, not, not to the court. That's, I guess, sort of the reality. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, finally, because we're uh, running out of time, I want to uh, briefly say just a comment and then have you guys uh, give us a, a brief conclusion as to the uh, you know takeaways and, and specific you know for the uh, accountability ahead, uh, the road ahead for these new technologies. Uh, this is something that we discuss, and I would love to have more time so, yet, so that you guys can actually go into the details, but I'm going to just briefly mention it. And, you know, given the fact that our patent system is the way it is right now with, you know, with, the, with, with all the deficiencies that one can point out, uh, you know, you always find a way, you know, with what you're given to get some sort of protection at the end of the day for emerging technologies. Uh, the bottom line is that you, you need, to, as a practitioner, you need to make an assessment as to, you know, what's lacking on your protection or, or, or what other ways, you know, you could use to complement 
that's patent protection or what's lacking on your patent protection. And, and there are other ways, and we talk about that, and that's something that practitioners need to be aware and then they need to prepare for that scenario, you know, that they can use other types of IP protection to complement what's not been possible to protect because of the patent systems. Uh, you know, briefly, we have at a, uh, right now with the COVID vaccines, you know, there are people arguing against a compulsory licenses. Uh, and then you, you need to understand that there are other, other intellectual property issues surrounding the technology that's been patented. So, you know, there might be trade secrets, there might be know-how that are very specific for the, uh, uh, for the owner of that patent. So, you know, and that's because they have spent the time to work on those different IP protection scenarios. Uh, and that's something that we need to consider. So as a conclusion, I would like to hear from both of you. Uh, what, if any, you think have been the changes from past approaches that patent offices have assumed towards emerging technologies and what's been doing, what, what, what they have been doing right now and what can you extrapolate for future technologies based on those two scenarios? Greg. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, knowing and learning from what we've seen in the past, we, we and I'll, I'll give you, you know, sort of the view from the US and then just for the view from Europe. Um, I think the office uh, is usually very aware of new trends, significant new trends in terms of technology, and then makes an effort uh, to reach out to industry, to have discussions, have conferences where major people can come together, thought leaders, and discuss the issues, um, and hear both sides of the debate. And also hear about what's important for protection and uh, so forth. And then also they do a very good job typically of making sure they're, um, they're examining core, the examiners are trained. Uh, they'll bring in speakers, they'll, they'll provide training. Um, they've also, and they've done a lot of creative things. They've, they've um, also partnered with industry to have examiners go and visit on site to companies and get training and information. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the other big piece is getting training, legal, uh, legal training um, and guidance out in terms of how, how, how issues like inventorship, patentability, um, the requirements for, you know, this drafting a specification claim, all those sort of issues getting uh, guidelines and recommendations out that can be used by the examiners as well as uh, practitioners. So it, it takes a lot of effort, but historically, uh, the patent office has done a very good job focusing in on new trends, new technologies, and making sure all of those, those pieces come together. Thank you, Greg. And Jesper? Yeah, but uh, I may I, remind you we have we have two minutes left, but I have asked for a couple of minutes more. So please okay. go ahead. Okay, but I, I agree with Gregory and the, also for for the EPO, um, and they will probably do what they have been doing so far. They will adapt adapt uh, in the same way by making guidelines and, and finding a way to go through navigate through the system. But what I really think is that the, the patent system has been really lucky so far because even though there has been a lot of development in technologies, it's just expo exponentially rising right now. And I really don't think that the patent system can keep up with that speed. So I think that they would have to, the, and yeah, I cannot tell this how the solution would be, but uh, I, if you look at, for example, computing power, it's not so far, so many years, so much, 20, 30 years ago, maybe, ah, it's a bit more bit, where they where just the computer can add up two numbers was like a, the whole building. And very soon you will be able to paint uh, a lot of uh, processing power with on a, on a wall that would, would be a million more intelligent than that. So I, so I think that and technology is really fast, developing fast, and that would be a, a big problem for the patent system. Yeah, um, it, it touches on a good point, which is speed of the office to examine applications. 
So if you assume that the number of filings keep going up and matching the innovations, they're going to become overloaded with applications to process. And if you can't process and get your case examined, the patent system's no good, right? So that's a serious issue in terms of speed to uh, examine, processing speed of examining applications. And I don't know, maybe they'll find computer uh, tools, AI tools to help help with the examination, but that's that's a big issue too. Yeah, and then AI will grant patents to AI. Yeah, that's, that's, scary, that's right. That'll be the next one. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's maybe that's the new road ahead of patent, Tavi. Right? That's right. Yeah, artificial intelligence granting patents to itself. Well, uh, uh, guys, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, uh, and on behalf of ACP and all the participants, we would like to thank you for your time, for sharing us your your experience, your knowledge in this particular topic. And I guess it's safe to conclude this uh, topic by. Uh, stating that uh, regardless of time, uh, patent systems have always uh, been faced with uncertainty uh, because of the technology themselves and also because, uh, you know, law changes constantly. Uh, it, one might argue that it changes slowly, but it does change. And historically, uh, the patent systems have either adapt to the technologies of have forced the technologies or the protection afforded to the technologies to be constrained within certain known parameters. At the end of the day, which is the takeaway from this, there's always history to learn from. Okay. Again, thank you very much uh, for your time. We encourage you to continue participating with the uh, rest of the topics and activities during the, reg the rest of the day. Again, thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.